Good morning, my friends. John Peterson from the Arlington Institute here, and we're just great. To, it's great to have you with us. We're here to talk about transition talks, our upcoming talk on April the 15th on tax day here in Berkeley Springs, just down the road from Washington, D.C. and Baltimore where we're going to feature our old friend, David Martin. Hello, David. It's nice John, to lovely to see you again. Yeah, it's always fun to have you here. We had a great time last year when you were here, kind of sold the place out, and it was uh, a marvelous time, and we're really looking forward to having you down at the Star Theater again here in Berkeley Springs. So. I'm looking forward to it as well, and we are delighted that so many people from around the world have been I'm um, not only physically present for that presentation, but the online version of it seems to continue to have a life of its own. So it's yeah. all good. Yeah, it's really quite uh, wonderful. And this talk that you're going to give here in, uh, on the 15th of April is uh, kind of amazingly timely. We're in the middle of uh, what Martin Armstrong, the great forecaster, has said is the year from hell. Uh, and he and uh, Cliff High, for instance, have both said that April and May are going to have some extraordinary kind of events that are going to happen and that this, this is going to be one of the most memorable years in perhaps written, you know, recorded history as we understand it. And so it's going to be wonderful to have you here to kind of do an overview and a perspective of what you see coming downstream. So tell us a little bit about it. Well, you know, in his inaugural address in 1933, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt famously said, the only thing we have to fear is yeah. fear itself. And he said that in the backdrop of two very important things, an economic system that was in total chaos. You'll recall that we were not even coming out of the depression at that time. We were pre the massive interventions to stabilize then the nascent Federal Reserve System, which enslaved the entire world into a debt-based economy and essentially allowed FDR to move in with the socialism impulses of Social Security and of the SEC and of the FDIC and all of these quasi-state agencies that became ubiquitous, allegedly, for the state to protect humans. So. We had that going on. And then we had this rise of fascism and we had this rise of geopolitical paroxysms in the wake of World War I, where we saw Europe falling apart. We saw despots rising and falling all over the place. And so when he said that, that's a pretty big statement because there was a lot to fear in 1933. And when he said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, what he was trying to get across to people was the fact is that what we do with the information about large scale transformation is up to us. Now, not surprisingly, his warning was echoed again in 2015 when Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and later, about a year later, Bill Gates said, we all should fear the period between 2018 and 2025, which was when AI was going to take over. And that was what we were all supposed to fear. So the good news is we're landing right on schedule with where fear was forecast by the people who actually were the ones architecting the agencies that they were themselves were fearing. So this is a perfect time to be in Berkeley Springs, because who knows, if things get interesting, at least Berkeley Springs is a good place to be. Well, this is going to be a wonderful opportunity to kind of look across the horizon at the different things that are incoming and kind of stitch them together in a uh, kind of an integrated kind of picture. You know, yeah, and I think that's where we sometimes lose sight of, of our own capacity and our own agency to control how we respond to events. Remember that the value of foresight, not unlike the value of a weather forecast, tells you when it's a good time to cut hay or when it's a good time to sail or when it's a good time to pack your gear in and go camping. The, the forecast doesn't tell you you're going to have a good camping trip. It doesn't tell you you're going to make it across the ocean. But what it does do is it gives you an indication of what you should be prepared for so that when you experience the things you experience, you're not surprised. That's because right. the, the, the value of forecasting is really to de-amplify the value of shock. Absolutely. And if what we can do is recognize that 
that we are at the natural maturity of a number of systems that we knew were going to break. You know, we've talked about this before, the social security system, which was designed to fail. So the good news is it's failing. We know it. But the opportunity that that presents, just like the opportunity we have to rely on the telecommunications network and on the surveillance state networks and all of the things that have been put in place, the great news about knowing that these things were designed with failure in mind is that when we can see that this was actually not the end of us, it's the end of an era. This is the end of a phase and the emergence of something new. At that point in time, we realize that the quality of the inputs, what we bring to the table, how we engage, what our energy is, the quality of the in inputs will determine the quality of our experience. And that's the value of foresight. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you bring a very up a very important point, and that is that, you know, if you haven't thought about something, you get surprised and then it drives you into fear. And right. the, the size and the magnitude of the kind of things that are inbound here are just guaranteed to, you know, if you haven't thought about it beforehand, uh, then you, know, you, you you're out of time and money and ideas uh, all at the same time. And it really uh this is this is a time that you got to start to kind of build images of the context of the map yeah you well well you know john we can talk about the physics of entanglement and quantum connection and we we allow that to happen in one dimension but we don't understand that that exact same dimension exists in our own construction so if we are concerned about the outcomes of a particular set of circumstances or a particular event horizon, what we should know is that we have the ability by virtue of entanglement to bring forward our own experiences yeah. that are the things that we desire to see manifest. Now, this yeah. is not as trite as the secret or your Pinterest interest yeah. board, but this is saying that if we set intentions that say yeah. there is an alternative narrative that we can help manifest having that energy in the field does in fact alter the field and and you yeah. know that's not woo woo that's not spirituality that is quantum entangled reality that's that's right and this vision of this new desired world is kind of central to all of this it generates no question it generates hope it is the kind of the mechanism underneath everything that if you have some idea you see the light at the end of the tunnel that in fact it gives you the hope to that you're on your way to someplace different than where you've been <laughs> no question and i find that the vast majority of people who find themselves drawn into the fear narrative or drawn into the scarcity of opportunity narrative or whatever that is in fact are manifesting energy into the very thing they yeah. ultimately fear. So listen, the value of the conversation has always been understand that the systems were designed and they were designed to do what they do. So the good news is they were designed for the thing they accomplished. But like every other system, they have a used by date. And it turns yeah. out that the convergences that are happening this year and through 2028 are convergences of the natural expiration date of a lot of things. And that's okay. That means that the world is transforming and we are here to be part of it. And yeah. you are in Berkeley Springs to be part of it. Yeah. There's a, a whole kind of mind shift that has to happen. To, and uh, what we're, that's exactly what you're going to talk about and what we're going to talk about. And more than that, we're going to talk about how kind of how you get from here to there. Yeah. You know, what are the kind of practical things? How do you prepare yourself uh, for this epic uh, kind of transition, uh, the likes of which we've never seen before? Yeah. Well, so, listen, it's it, it is always a delightful thing. One of the things that I suggest to people when they think about coming to the transition talks in Berkeley Springs is that this is a format that we don't have anywhere near enough. We don't have the larger open format where we have both the generosity of the time, which allows us to cover a topic more thoroughly, but then we also have the intimacy in Berkeley Springs of having conversations which are both at and then following or prior to the event. So as much as people have gotten accustomed to the online kind of approach to this, I, I hardly recommend 
being part of the analog community, the people who get together, because it turns out that 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 agora, that bringing together of the people who are from diverse walks of life, from multiple perspectives, from all over the country and the world, bringing those individuals together under a common location becomes its own dynamic that is in fact capable of shifting systems. So as much as it might be fun to watch it online, you know, pack yeah. your bags, uh, check check out the weather forecast and get yourself to Berkeley Springs. Yeah, it's going to be great. It always is. And it's a, it'll be a full uh, Saturday on the 15th of April. You know, we ended up, as you know, with a kind of a dinner with 30 or 40 people. And it's a delightful kind of opportunity to uh, visit our little resort town. So for those of you who are viewing, uh, we just uh, really encourage you and help, hope that you can come and be with us. You can find out complete information at transitiontalks.org. Uh, it's the 15th of April, tax day, and you can come and be part of the analog community here. There you go. Here, here in Berkeley Springs. David, we're looking forward to having you with us, and thanks so much, and we're going to uh, uh, include here and with this clip, a little clip of some other kind of things that you've been talking about lately, and so it's... Uh, uh, it's going to be a full and wonderful day. And we're looking beautiful. Forward. Thanks, John. There's so much talk about machines and automation taking over the human role that we forget that it's human beings and their creativity that they bring to that that tells the machines what to do. Humans actually matter. The creativity and the ingenuity of a human being actually fuels the value of the enterprise. And that Proof only comes when you can measure it. We're measuring patents and copyrights and trademarks, brands, messaging. IP, patents, the whole gang. We put all of that together and then overlay market data so that we bring those two worlds of information together. And out of that is born the measure of human creativity. In a world increasingly run by machines, what we've shown is the human element still stands not a bit above, but way above all other value in the marketplace. And we proved it in the biggest market on earth, the largest cap, largest equity market on the planet. We've shown that humans and human innovation and creativity win. CNBC is launching a new index today called the CNBC IQ100. It's basically an index of what we're calling innovation leaders. We're talking things like patents, their trademarks, brand equity, so on and so forth. Keep an eye out for it, guys. Another big day for the stocks in the CNBC IQ100 index. Hitting all-time highs today. CNBC IQ100 is up 28.5%. It's now up 37%. Hitting new all-time highs it's today. It's up more than 41% in a year. Outpacing the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the Russell.